Arushi is a designer for social good, making handmade products that are relevant for the modern consumer. Combining traditional handcrafting processes with design and focusing on the consumer experience, Arushi seeks to create positive impact and create value in consumers' lives through her venture, The Initiative. Through hand quilting garments from textile waste and garment waste, they create high quality, functional and ethically made products by generating sustainable livelihood opportunities for low income communities. She's also a global shaper, part of the Chandigarh Hub, and prior to this worked in Denmark on various design and research projects. Hi Arushi, welcome for this episode of Bear Thought. Arushi, can you just start off by telling everyone about yourself? Um, so, well, okay, <laughs> I'm, um, the founder of a brand called The Initiative and, um, I have a background in product design, which is, uh, somewhere linked with what I do, uh, through the brand and we work with, uh, traditional craft and specifically with, uh, hand quilted products and, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's there's a lot more to to speak about, but we could probably unravel that as we go along. <laughs> sure. Where you grew up, what did you study? Um, where did you spend most of your time growing up? So I uh, am born and brought up in from Bombay. Uh, I still refuse to call it Mumbai. It's still very much Bombay to me. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I did my schooling in Bombay, after which I was out of the city for approximately, I think, eight, nine years. Um, then I was back for a while. And now I uh, live in Chandigarh, which is uh, where I function from. Um, my education post-schooling was uh, in Pune. And uh, after that, I've spent some time in uh, Delhi, as uh, in Gurgaon, actually, specifically, and um, also in Denmark, where I was working with a design consultancy as a research and strategy designer. So, yeah. Nice. Okay, lovely. So can you tell us a little bit about the initiative? Sure. So, um, as I mentioned, the initiative is, um, is a is a brand that we work where we work with craft and uh, primarily the aim is to provide a sustainable income to low income craftsmen people through uh, products that are not only handcrafted but also functional and well designed and why that functionality is really important is uh, because i had come across i think a lot of instances where i was faced with a very beautifully crafted product but really couldn't find a way to integrate that into my life or find a way for it to be useful to me. And that became a huge deciding factor in whether I purchased that product or not. It wasn't a question about the craftsperson's skill. And it wasn't sometimes even a question of what price the product was at. It was more so where I could see it fitting into my life. Um, And I felt that that was a huge gap, which um, was sort of, in a sense, plaguing our craft sector, where uh, people were making products that were not necessarily uh, keeping the end consumer in mind. So the initiative started as um, an adventure, I'd say, but it started as an effort to really um, use design to bridge that gap between urban consumers and our traditional craftspeople. So we work right now primarily with the craft of uh, hand quilting, which is called different things in different states uh, across our country. I mean, it's called uh, Kantha in West Bengal. It's called the Godhari in Maharashtra. It's referred to as uh, Sujni in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. So there's a lot of, um, it, it's kind of deeply ingrained in every aspect of every um, home in, in, in traditional craft, if you think of it. And um, so what we do is we work with garment production waste, which is hand quilted and then made into a whole range of products, keeping in mind the end consumer. So that's a very important sort of um, aspect for us, that the people who use the products at the end, it needs to be something that works for them. Awesome. So I love the way you incorporate circularity. So you take all of these little um, uh, pieces of, textile that might be waste otherwise and then Mm -hmm. you 
hand quilted work with communities that um, are traditionally artisan communities and then quilt it and then you make really cool stylish high functional um, high utility products that are things like laptop sleeves bags tote bags yoga bags and more right right so I think what what is really important to note here right Sahar is that um, craft and circularity are sort of um, then there's, it's difficult to separate the two, right? I mean, if you see our traditional craft practices, they were inherently sustainable. And the main sort of starting point of that was because things were only made when they were needed or things were made to address or fulfill a particular need. They weren't just made for the sake of making them, you know? Um, I mean, if you see any of our product, any of our crafts, not necessarily just what we do with waste fabric but if you see most of our traditional crafts they like the the raw materials came from the local ecosystem the production was done for local uses local um, sort of needs everything sort of this this whole concept of circularity that we speak of today was something that was very uh, intrinsically woven into those practices and as a way to really keep those uh, true to themselves that's the reason why we only work with garment production waste because i mean uh, the whole concept of quilting if you if you think of it across the world has always been to work with waste i mean if you if you look at quilting right from japan to india to any other country that's known for quilting um, it started from uh, fixing say fabrics that were worn out or um, making do with what you had to kind of make a new product right and somewhere along the line it became this a uh, craft where people buy meters or yardage of fabric cut it up and restitch it back together which completely defeats the purpose of the craft in itself so so that was something we were very clear about that the products had to be made keeping true to the craft you know, and, and of course, as a huge benefit of that is the fact that there is circularity incorporated into it and that every product made is completely one of a kind, right? Yeah. That's genuinely, really beautiful. You'll def definitely never find two products that look the same. When exactly. You're yeah. Um, can you tell us what was the inspiration behind setting up the initiative in the first place? Um, so, so the initiative started in a sense it started in my great grandmother's courtyard in 2013 okay um i was there on vacation and i had taken some saris with me that i wanted to get quilted into blankets for myself and i think one thing led to another where there were the there was this group of women who some of whom i had known my entire life and i realized that they had this skill that would have been of great value to so many people but it's not something that they perceived as a skill like this in 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 marathi like they called it a ghargudi craft which is like just a home you know like just something we do at home so initially the initiative was to show them it, it was kind of to prove to them that hey you guys have a skill this is something that people would pay for this is um something that others would value so the the first i think almost the first year was just trying to prove to them that you know that what they had was a skill and a craft and that there was a market for it and then after that i think things sort of just developed as they went along so i think my inspiration if i really talk about it was to to see how we could create value in the craft, not just for the consumer, but even for the the craftswomen in this case who were who were working on that product, right, or who were working in that particular skill. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that you said it actually, in a sense, started in my grandmother's courtyard. <laughs> in not not my grandmother, my great grandmother's. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact one of the first few pictures I have of the quilts that I put up on my on my first website is is on this swing in her courtyard that um, I mean anyone from our family if they see that picture they know exactly where it is um, and it was a swing that I have never I mean she she passed away when I was a year old so I don't have many memories of her but 
I I've sort of lived in that house so much and heard so many stories about her. Um, as it turns out, she was also like in the early 1940s. She was uh, a midwife in this. In, so her home is in Panchgani. And um, she was a midwife there. So she used to travel in the middle of the night down the ghats with just a lantern to go deliver babies in the nearby village. And these are just some of the stories I've heard about her. So it was kind of a very, um, I'd say it was like fate that it had to start there. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. That's really cool. Um, I think, you know, the initiative has a lot of soul. You just kind of shared a little bit of history of it and kind of some of your family roots. Can you tell us a little bit about what sustainability means to you? So I think personally to me, sustainability is, it's a journey, right? It's not really one particular answer to one particular problem. And I don't think it's possible to say that, for anyone to say that I live a completely sustainable life, you know. But it's just about how... Um, we can make more conscious decisions on a daily basis. To me, that's sustainability. And and I'd also like to give an example of say how through the initiative, that's something that I try to to keep in mind. So when we when we started the initiative, um, there were a lot of choices that we made in order to just get the product out, or you know, or just to um, to get the women to see the scope or believe that there was a market, right? That people would buy their stuff. But then it was a conscious decision slowly and steadily to replace materials that we weren't particularly happy about. So say if we were using uh, something that had a plastic component to it, uh, was it possible for us to say switch to a metal component or switch to um, say a component that we could make fabricate out of fabric itself? Um, where we were using, so our lining was, is store-bought fabric so we transition from that into it being handwoven fabric so you know small small steps and incremental changes to, to keep improving the product keep improving your choices and I think that translates to personal life as well where say I, I use a shampoo but now I'm working on figuring out alternatives or brands where I can purchase sustainable alternatives. So it's it's a step by step process. Right? Like, like I said, it's a journey. Yeah, truly, it is a journey and it's not possible for everyone to live um, completely, you know, zero waste or completely. Mm -hmm. whatever. I think it's really up to us to try and incorporate whatever we can in baby steps into our lifestyle so we can just live the, our best lives, I suppose. Truly. Without Kind of um, adding to the environmental footprint and pressuring our time. Definitely. <laughs> cool. Um, if you had to give one piece of advice to someone who wanted to start a business with the themes of sustainability or circularity, what would be that one piece of advice you'd like to give them? Um, I think I'd say that there's a lot that's happening out there in, in terms of sustainability, like a lot of people and a lot of brands making efforts. So if there's someone who's looking to start something in the same direction, uh, take some time to do your research, right? Take some time to find out who's doing what. And what I found is that usually people who are working with sustainability are very, very open to collaboration and sharing and helping each other, you know, because the larger ecosystem is always what everyone has in mind. So, so do that research and sort of figure out where you can gain and where you can also add before you really plan out uh, a business plan or kind of work on something larger than that. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so just during this, you know, time with the pandemic, how have you kind of taken this time to, um, you know, recoup or invent or what have you been doing over the past few times? Can you share anything um, that might be some positive trends or anything that has helped you during this time? Um, so so this whole lockdown pandemic time, it's it was interesting, uh, to say the least. Also pushed a lot of people to, to rethink um, their choices because of a lack of access. And 
I think for me, that lack of access started with a simple thing like um, pre-processed food, because as I said, I'm I'm originally from Bombay and my tastes are very um, Maharashtrian slash South Indian. So when I... Um, when I visit Bombay, I I would usually pick up like a supply of things that I don't get here in Chandigarh. You know, something as simple as um, these these little mirchis that are stuffed, which you can fry and eat with curd rice. Okay, something as simple as that. And just around the lockdown is when my supply of those mirchis or those chilies was completely coming to an end. And it sounds like something really small, but in my head, I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? <laughs> So it's something as simple as that. And I um, spoke to a cousin and got the recipe and spent time actually making those chilies. And then I realized that it was actually so simple. It was something that I could have done years ago. So I've learned, I think, a lot more in terms of being self-sufficient in the home uh, while that it could be anything from like I've started making my own conditioner like my own hair conditioner and I started making these sort of like dried um, foods or things that I have a palate for um, so in terms of like from a personal perspective I think I really took the time to explore what changes I could make in my life and then sort of slowly and steadily go through each of them, reach out to people who I knew had experience with it and learn from them. Um, and and from, I think, um, a perspective of work, it, it's been kind of eye-opening because you realize how much of what you do is extra or is like the frills and fancies. And when we were in the lockdown, it was, uh, everything was cut down to bare minimum. So, if it could run on bare minimum then, then we don't need to have so much more than we normally do, right? And, and I think that that principle sort of applies to our, our personal lives as well, because with uh, something as simple as clothes, um, through most of the lockdown, I think I wore the same five pairs of clothes in rotation. And while I am not someone with a massive wardrobe to begin with, I realized that I can even further cut down what I have or potentially not even buy anything for the next year or two and still be completely fine and completely happy. So that's where I'm at so far, at least. Lovely. Um, that's so true. I've literally worn like two sets of pajamas in <laughs> days. Um, so completely mirror your sentiments. Um, I love that you also call yourself a people-centered designer and maker. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So as I as I mentioned um, with the initiative, one of the main aspects is uh, keeping the end user in mind when we design the products. And um, I think that so so that comes from my previous um, like experience from education and work in the design sector. And I'll take the example of one of our products to kind of explain this better. So we have this book, which is called, which we call the organizer book. And it's essentially like a file of facts, right? So while most handmade books that you buy, you'd use the 50 pages, the 100 pages, and then they're done for. With this book, what we've done is we've incorporated a binder inside. To take it a step further, if you compare it to a Filofax, because that's what I gave you as an example, a Filofax has, like, usually, if, you, if you've used one, you'd know, it has um, four, five, six, like a weird number of holes. And nobody ever owns a punch for that many holes. In addition to that, the paper will be some weird, like, half of A5 or a third off of A5 or some, it, it's just a weird size. Nobody owns paper. And nobody owns punches that can help them refill those books. So you have to go back and you have to go to Filofax and buy their paper to, you know, refill the book. So what we've done is in this book, it's um, A5, two hole punch, which everybody owns. It's in every office, in every home. And we want the end consumer to be able to use the book in a way that suits them 
in a way that suits their needs. So it's a single product, but it can be used by an artist. It can be used by a professional to make their like schedules or keep track of their to-do lists or, you know, things like that. It can be used by, I mean, just about anybody for any purpose. Um, I use mine, for example, with waste paper. So we collect waste paper and then flip it over, uh, punch it and put it into the book. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, and why a lot of us do that, right? Like a lot of us reuse waste paper. It's always these little bits of paper that are lying around everywhere. So this is just a simpler system to, to actually uh, streamline using those things. And, and all these little actions are really keeping the user in mind, right? So it's not so much about, uh, oh, I need to make a book that increases my profitability or increases the customer coming back to me every time they want paper. But it's just about how, how, do, people, how do people use a book? What do people use it for? How can we design something that enables people to kind of plug their own creativity or their own personality into a product that they own, where you know, it becomes an extension of their routine or of their, um, of, of all their stuff, right? And so that's where this whole, the whole people-centered designer sort of comes in. And the maker part is I've grown up being taught crafts at home, in school, in anywhere that, you know, anyone who is willing to teach me. So I myself um, make a lot of things. So when it comes to the crafts person side, um, when when we speak of, say, the hand quilting, right, that all our crafts people do, um, I'm not one of those people who stands on the sidelines and says, um, okay, this is how I need you to do it. Because I myself have made it, I have the I'm a, I have the ability and the skill, thankfully, to be able to you know do that myself. So I'm a little more connected to the makers as well. Um, I understand the pains, the problems, the issues. Like if you've ever sat and quilted a sheet, um, which is um, say five feet by seven and a half feet, if you've ever ever sat and done that, you know how much it hurts your back you know how much it hurts your fingers, you know how much it bothers your neck, you know. And when you've done these things, you're able to have much better empathy for the um, artisans as well. You're able to understand their perspective of um, the whole, in a sense, production as well. So so I think that's where these, these two sort of things fit in for me. Lovely. Can you also share a little bit more about the makers? Can you share more about the community you work with? Sure. So we, I, I started working with a specific community uh, in Panchkani in 2013. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't really able to continue working with them post two years uh, because of logistical challenges. But now what we do is we, we work with uh, two, two types of groups. One is directly with self-help groups. So women who are self-organized and are looking for work in, in, a, in this craft of godhani making or quilt making. And we also partner with NGOs who are in the livelihood space, who want, um, who say are providing training, have the infrastructure, but need someone to come in and close the loop for them uh, by say further training, providing of orders and um production related needs so so that's what we do right now we we work with uh, two NGOs one based out of uh, Chandigarh and one based out of Bombay and the self-help groups that we work with one is in Pune and we have another one in Chandigarh lovely awesome and what do you think is the future of the initiative so the the future of the initiative is actually something that I've been I've been thinking a lot about over this uh, lockdown period because as I mentioned to you you know there's so many things that I've come to realize were not so necessary and that are things that we can do more efficiently. So one of the things that we have actually started doing even prior to the lockdown is we work with um, craft NGOs and craft organizations to fill in the gaps when it comes to designs and systems, 
right? Um, design systems and, in a sense, even services. So it, it's one could call it a consulting model. Uh, it's somewhat like that. But what we do is say if an NGO is working with a particular craft group and they have they have everything from the workshop to the maybe the field coordinator to, you know, all these different um, operational roles. But what we do is go in and work with the craft people. We train them on design, on color. We work with the core team of the organization to put in systems for quality checking processes, for understanding how to translate a design from a drawing to a product, um, how to do something as simple as photography of the product, you know, things like that. So I, I see um, the like the future of not just the initiative, but craft sort of going in that direction because we need to be able to equip our craftspeople who are at the grassroots. We need to equip them with the skills needed to to bring their products out, right? Um, so it's it's a bit, um, it sounds very entitled to say that, oh, I'm a designer and I'm going to come and teach you how to, you know, make your products better because that's totally not the case. The, the craftspeople themselves, they're creative individuals. That's why they're doing what they're doing. And just with a little more um, information access and a little more access to the internet, um, a little more guidance from a uh, structural perspective, they can themselves, you know, do that, do a, a fair chunk of what we think we need to do for them. So I, I sort of see the initiative going down that path. I mean, it's already on that route, but, but I see it going down that path of uh, working to enable these sort of changes rather than just being a product-based retail business, you know? Yeah, that's thank you so much for sharing. I think that makes a lot of sense of uh, being an enabler in the ecosystem to mm -hmm. uh, enable product design, enable communities um, to basically make these amazing solutions in different formats. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, great, Arushi, thank you so much. I've learned so much just listening to you. Thank you so much for taking off time uh, to chat with us. Uh, thank you for joining us for this episode. Thanks so much.